nothing like that amp. You know, I think it's a 60. Well, I'm not sure when the silver face, uh, when they changed from the black to the yeah, silver. Yeah, right. Face. Yep. But I know I had it. It was sort of like my my second amp. Second amp. Well, when I first got into the session thing, uh, I had come straight from the club, so I had a big uh, super reverb with four heavy Jensen speakers in it. So as soon as I started getting a number of sessions and having to go f from one to the other and drag that big amplifier, because originally we didn't have the cartridge services, you know. Yeah, right, yeah. I think the only one that had it was Hal Blaine, the drummer. He had his private guy with a van that would go set him up for his next session, because there's no way he could be tearing down his drum kit and then driving and setting it up again. Yeah. Uh, but shortly after that, uh, SIR, Studio Instrument Rentals, started up. Oh, yeah. And they became the cartridge company for all of us guys. Yeah. So since we had that, we started getting more and more equipment, you know. We had a big um, case full of, you know, 20 guitars and, and all of our equipment. But uh, the reason that the, the little Princeton was so practical was because in those days, there were, we were recording with a lot of open mics in the room, obviously. Yeah. Yeah. So um, we had to play at a low level, which meant if, if, if you needed to crank that amp up so that you got a bit of dirt or, and stuff like that, just a little bit of distortion, it was so loud that the engineer would come out and scream at you to turn your damn amp down. Yeah, you know, right. Because it's going in the, the drum mics, the piano mics. Yeah. So my dear son-in-law, Corey Fight, who was a genius, he was working at Valley Arts Guitars. Cool. And uh, he did this Paul Rivera mod for me on my Princeton that gave me the master volume and, and a few other push and pull things for the more treble boost or, yep. and all of that so we could we could go from this clean uh, to a very quick uh, if we needed it for the next tune mm -hmm. a, uh, If the next tune we call for uh, that nice tone again, yeah, we just go back. Or if you wanted a little bit of uh, a little bit of, uh, you know, say if it was. Yep. So how long had you had the amp when you got it modified? Uh, I would have had it uh, probably a couple of years because uh, I, I know when I did Diamond Girl, that was an overdub so I could crank it up to get that bit of... Uh, so, uh, but I was able to, uh, like I say, I could crank it till I got just the amount of distortion I wanted. Yep. But uh, so for low down. The and then for the solo, I had a, a, some cheap fuzz tone. Yeah. So it handles that kind. 
kind of yeah stuff yeah really well. So I see you got like the, the label tape on there. Is, is that the, has that always been on there? Oh, that's so yeah. It was always on there except four of them have fallen off. So yeah. Uh, and what have you got on there? You got presents, master, game boosts. Yeah, that's the master. Yeah, the master. Because the master does have a gain boost if you pull it out as well oh, yeah? to get you even more. How loud would you typically have it in a session? Because, like I said, it's not that loud right now that's talking volume. It's on three, and um, it would be uh, in, in a room with musicians. I wouldn't have it much louder than that. Yep. They just close mic it. Uh, and most of the time they just put a 57 on there. Yeah. It sounded brilliant. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And that's always been your go-to mic, 57? Yeah, I yep. mean... It's a sound we know, isn't it? They got such good sounds, I figured, well... But, you know, I've come in and, like everybody, tried 40 different mics on it, and then, oh, well, let's go back to that. Go back to, to that. Yeah. So are you very particular about mic positioning? Well, only that I know the further you get away from the center, the less highs it has. If yep. you want that real peaky bright thing, you put it in the center. But most of the time, I'm over uh, just inside the outside of the cone. Yep, yep. Um, straight so, on, angle. Yeah, straight on. Yep. Yeah. I mean, that just works for me. Yeah. Uh, and, but I listen, and if it's a tune where I do want a bit more brightness, I just, it's easy to to move it over closer to the center. It is the amp you've used on most of the stuff throughout uh, your career, well, isn't it? I, oh yeah, I know I did it on all the Motown, all the Jackson 5, uh, Lionel Richie. Uh, pretty much uh, everything. Yeah. Yeah, pretty much everything because uh, it didn't take me long to get rid of that big four speaker thing because I was having to carry carry it around to every session, so I yeah. said, no, this, this is not working. Smaller amps tend to sound better mic'd up anyway, don't they? It's a 12-inch it's speaker, is it? Uh, this is a 10 inch. It's a 10, okay. And uh, you can't get that speaker anymore either. That's why this this amp... I have someone that made, made me a, a clone, uh, Bruce Kerr, a good friend of mine in New Zealand. He, mm -hmm. he copied everything in it but he couldn't get that speaker. Ah, okay. Uh, because I wanted an amp like this that I could take out and play in the little clubs, but I didn't want to take this one around yeah. because to me it's too it's too valuable to for it's a piece me. of history right there, isn't it? Yeah. It doesn't get far away from my chair whenever wherever I'm recording. Uh, I mean, I've got some other things, you know, I'll run the basement through, nice speaker cab here. The camera cabinet, they here, right, camera they? cab. Yeah. And then I have this uh, Dumbo clone yep. that I, if I'm looking for that kind of sound. But I would say 95% of my work, I, I'll, I'll, I'll put a mic in front of the Princeton. Yeah. And uh, I'm just so familiar with that sound, you know, just such a beautiful full sound and so versatile. So. So do you remember the first session you ever used it on? It would have been a Monkey session or a Jackson 5 or a Carpenters because okay. I started doing all that stuff around, you know, pretty close to the same time. Yeah. Is this the amp you used on last round of Clarksville? Yeah. It is? Mm -hmm. Hey! <laughs> yeah. That's one iconic intro, man. One iconic intro. And you came up with that on the fly, didn't you? Yeah, I did. And, and when we got in the studio to record it, they kept wanting me to turn it up louder and louder. It's the one time that they, they just kept saying, no, turn it up, turn it up, you know. And this is before you had it modified, right? Yeah. 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 So you're getting closer to the sound that you get it, now yeah, at a lower volume. But yeah, uh, a very bright, uh, just a little bit of a grungy on, on the top end. Yeah. But a very bright, loud sound. It really cuts through on the record, though. Can you I, give us a bit of the intro? Um. I'm pretty sure I did it with a flat pick now. That's that sound. Yeah. I 
couldn't hear for about five minutes after we played that tune, <laughs> after we recorded it. Is there anything you can remember that you didn't use this on? I, th I think you've mentioned one or two along the way. You didn't use it on Hello, did you? Am I right in thinking you used a Rockman for that? I did, a Tom yeah, Schultz Rockman. Yep. Yeah, we uh, just had it sitting on the desk in the control room and I plugged into that and that's what we did the solo with. Did you write that or is that improvised? Well, it's just improvised. It just roll the tape and play, play some. Mind blowing, man. Yeah. Mind blowing. Yeah. So you like playing around the chords, kind of thing. How how would you have approached that? Do you think? Uh, definitely, uh, just knowing what the chords were. Um, of course, you know the story. Lionel had hummed a solo. He wanted the guitar to play. Okay. And he had three other guitar players learn the solo that he hummed. Yeah. And I did the same thing. I learned that solo, and I came in, and I and we recorded it. And to me, it didn't sound good as a guitar solo. Uh, so I said, just give me another track, and I'll and uh, let me play something else, just so you'll have an option. Yep. And we did that one other take, and that's the solo. Wow. That's completely different th from what he hummed. <laughs> because you can hear that that's you. I can hear that that feeling, uh, just the vibrato and, and the touch comes yeah. through that, yeah, that's you. Yeah, it became part of the record, you know. Like I say, once you hear it a thousand times, it's part of the record. Yeah, yeah. With so many of those things, you yeah. know. And uh, people don't like it when, if you play it live and you play something different, they don't like it. They say, Man, why don't you play what you played on the record? You know? Yeah. So whenever I do low down, or hello, or, or any of those things, I, I I go ahead and play like what I played on the record. Yeah. You know. That's what they want to hear. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I know another solo that you didn't use this on, and it's because it was on a classical guitar was "Play Me" by um, uh, Neil Diamond, right? Yes. Uh, I, I don't I don't remember how we decided to use the classical guitar on that. Um, but that was shortly after I had gotten into the session scene and had started adding guitars to my arsenal. And Al Casey had a little, had, had a guitar shop. Al Casey was uh, one of the guitar players that uh, I probably did more sessions with than anyone else because he was always the rhythm player and I was the lead player. Yeah. So he had a little guitar shop down there someplace. And uh, so I I got a 12 string from him and and the gut string uh, and probably a, an acoustic guitar. And uh, I used that little gut string on the, a lot of stuff, but a lot of the Neil Diamond stuff. Yeah. Um, and it was a hundred dollar guitar. Wow. <laughs> it played on a million seller. <laughs> Very valuable guitar now if it was still yeah. around. It might still be. Yeah. Before the session days, I could only afford one guitar at a time. And uh, so I only had one guitar uh, when I first started doing it. And then. Uh, we kept adding, you know, every week it was another guitar uh, because uh, as a session player we had to sometimes play a 12 string or a gut string or a banjo or a ukulele or any, a bazooka. We had everything yeah. in, in our trunk, yeah. yeah. So, How about effects? Were you ever using pedals that on your sessions as well? Well, in the early days, uh, there weren't really pedal boards. 
I think the pedals just started to come in. We had the crybaby, the wah wah pedal, uh, a distortion. Then there was like a, a chorus, uh, and uh, it so slowly turned into this. Who could get the most pedals, you know? <laughs> and, uh, and look at you now, like I said before, like looking over there, there's some nice pedals on yeah. there. Oh yeah. And I and I try to narrow it down to as few as I can, you know. Yeah. To to as far as carrying something around with me. Yeah. I've kind of learned that I can get by with a a couple of gain stage pedals, of course, uh, a reverb, a tuner, and maybe a delay. And this is the pedal board you're using now? Yes, it's the one I used uh, most recently, but I'm about to get rid of a couple of those mm -hmm. uh, because it has three gain stage pedals and I only need two. Okay, and do you stack those gains? Like you have multiples at the same time? Mm -hmm. yep. Sometimes. Yeah. I, I actually almost keep the little bit of the tube screamer on all the time. Yeah. Sustain. Yep. And I think there's a color in there too. It does slightly that lower mid bit of a hump. Much more of a jazz tone. There. Live, I, I used to keep it on all the time. Yep. There's a little bit of dirt in there. Yep. This the Roland CE2. Mm -hmm. I've got the one that has four knobs, but I like the one with the two knobs. Yeah, there. right. So, 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 you need. so has, has this amp been really reliable for you over the years? You ever had no, I've never with had it? any problem with really? it. Really? Do you get it retubed often? Oh uh, well my friend uh, Bruce Kerr has done a little bit of uh, touch up on it. I'm not sure what all he did, if he changed any tubes or what. I still have all the original tubes to it. Really? I've been asked a couple of times, what the hell were you doing in Australia? What brought you here? Well, I've been working with some, some guys from Sydney. Uh, they were in a band that I was producing there in LA and they kept telling me um, how much I would enjoy Australia. Yeah. Being, because they knew I liked the outdoors fishing and golfing and whatever. Yep. And um, at the time, um, LA was getting too big for me, too much traffic and all of that. And so we went down to Sydney for about five weeks and really loved it. Yep. And uh, of course, all of the major record labels were there, you know, RCA, Sony, EMI and all of them and I went around and met the people and they said yeah we got plenty of work come on down and at that time men at work were a big hit yep in excess midnight oil there was a lot of good stuff coming out mm. of Australia mm. so it was very tempting you know 
It was an adventure. Yeah. And it's not something that most people would have whatever, uh, I don't want to say guts or whatever, to pull up and, and make that kind of a move, but we did it. And yeah. we haven't been sorry. Yeah. We love it here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we love it here. Well, this has been fun, talking about the little amp that uh, that did so much. Absolutely, mate. Like I said, every time I come in here, it, it catches my eye, and I, I, I realize that's a little piece of history sitting right there. And the thing about it is, it, it just still sounds great. There's no, uh, there's not an, another amp uh, in this room, to me, that will do what that amp does. Yeah. Louis. Okay. Thank you, mate. All right, buddy. <laughs> Enjoyed it.